Welcome to The Truth Podcast. I'm your host, Hani Rambod, and I have a very special guest. All my guests are very special, but this gentleman doesn't quite come from the bodybuilding industry. He comes from the brain and heart and just building of men industry. I got Bedros Kulian in the house, and if you don't know who Bedros is, uh, you definitely want to go look him up, check out his Instagram page, and I would just really challenge you guys to be able to find a person that can be able to pull the mental toughness out of somebody uh, that quite like he does. Welcome to the show, brother. Thank you, man. What a great introduction, and I hope I live up to that. I appreciate it, honey. <laughs> you yeah. actually do, and the reason why I say you do is because <clears throat> you're a type of person. I the backstory here, guys. Um, for those of you that are watching on YouTube and the ones that are on Shop, uh, Spotify, Shopify, <laughs> Spotify, or any of the platforms. Uh, the thing about Bedros and I met through two different people the, when I first heard about you, yep. and that was through Andy Frisella yep. and through Phil Heath. Um, you know, Phil was, you know, connected with you and so was Andy and your name kept getting popped up in conversation. And when it came to who's out there that knows the space of this mental toughness and coaching, and it's just like, again, I know that there's a lot of people out there. And I want to talk to you about this because you've put together programs for some of the biggest names in this industry right. um, to be able to build their platforms. But you've also have your own. And so not only do you help build platforms, but you also have a couple of different programs. And when you go to your Instagram page, and for those that don't know, Bedros, and I loved it. We were just joking about this before we started. And I said, hey, man, it's just I don't even have to say your last name because people who know you, it's like it's like Madonna or Sting right. or, or Prince, right? You just, you know, Bedros. You don't have to say Bedros. What who. a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I feel like when you look at your Instagram page and you're looking at your social media pages, you can see some of these programs and it's almost like Navy SEAL training. And um, I want you to talk a little bit about that because you, can you tell me a little bit about how you got started in that and your thought process? Because there is such intricacies in what you do. Yeah, yeah. So the, the core of what I do is business coaching, right? And and I own, you know, several big companies like Fit Body Bootcamp, a fitness franchise, and Truly Supplements, and I co-own Fuel Hunt, this apparel company. But I've realized that the business plan is is easy as long as the businessman doesn't fuck it up and complicate it. And so I realized, well, what does the businessman need to do? Well, he needs to get rid of his vices. He needs to build mental toughness, emotional discipline, and he needs to have some resiliency, and he needs to be able to eat shit sandwiches. Think about how much shit you had to eat as you grew Evogen, yeah. right? Like, you thought that the plan was going to be, I start it, I make the supplement in my kitchen, and people are going to love it, and then I'm going to mass produce it, and then, but look at all the roadblocks and detours you had to overcome. And so the, I believe entrepreneurship is the highest level of personal development, and when people kind of want to take the path of entrepreneurship, no one thinks about mental toughness, resiliency, grit, emotional discipline. And today, we live in a world where you can order your burrito on an app and then customize it and then sit here and get frustrated when your burrito is delayed because of traffic and you're looking at it and you're saying, gosh, you know, it's on the corner of 44th Street and Peyton and I'm so upset. It's like life cannot be that soft where you're, you can't even go and fucking order and pick up a burrito at the shop anymore, right? Like right. you have to wait for it to get delivered to you. And so being that some of my coaching clients are Navy SEALs and Marine recon guys and Army Rangers, like guys that come out of the special operations community, once, they, once one of them finds you and gets good results from working with you as a business coach, they start telling each other. And uh, I've never been in the military. I'm not someone that spent time in the military when in 1993, when I graduated high school, Mrs. Boyer, one of my teachers said, you need to go to the Marine Corps. They're the only ones that can set you straight. So I graduated, went into the Marine Corps recruiting station, and uh, they said, hey, you've got flat feet. We can't take you. Today they'll take you because they build ortho orthotics in the shoes. And so I was like, damn, Mrs. Boyer said no one else is going to set me straight but the Marine Corps. So that was my closest attempt to getting in the military. But anyway, as I do business coaching, these guys from special operations community, they come out and they start getting results with the business ideas that they have and one guy tells the other and so before you know it i'm coaching and consulting all types of entrepreneurs but there's a category of military men who are like the tip of the spear navy seals army rangers um marine recon etc 
And once the word gets out, the bees like the guy you want to go coach with, uh, I ended up making friends with lots of them, mm -hmm. right? And so one of them, I was like, dude, can I use you as the Navy SEAL to bring the anger and the hardship for a 75-hour experience that I'm going to put these entrepreneurs through? And he goes, are you saying this is going to be like Bud's training? But for entrepreneurs, I go, well, yes, but they're going to pay 12 grand a piece and it's going to be for 75 hours, mm -hmm. you know, three days straight. Um, they're going to live on my compound. They're going to eat what we feed them. And I need you to be the hammer, you know, and I'm going to be Papa Bear. I'm going to teach them entrepreneurship. But I need you as a Navy SEAL and this Marine, his name is Steve, uh, you and the Marine really beat them down physically uh, so we can teach them mental toughness. He goes, all right, sir, I could do that. However, we're going to need a bell. I said, why do we need a bell? His name is Ray, Ray, Ray Cash, uh, Navy SEAL. He goes, well, some of these guys are going to quit. I'm like, you don't understand. They're not going to quit because they paid 12 grand. And so who would quit? He goes, I'm going to do my job right. They're going to quit. And so he went out and bought a bell just like they have in Buds. Right. right? Ring the bell and quit. And so the first project, it's called the project, the Modern Day Night Project, the first project that we ran, I didn't even have a website, honey. I literally put on Instagram and Facebook I'm looking for 12 dudes to pay me 12 grand. It's a 75 hour experience. I've got a MMA fighter, a Navy SEAL, a Marine and myself. We're going to put you through this like mental toughness, emotional resilience, business, entrepreneurship course. You're not going to get a lot of sleep. You're not going to get a lot of food. If all goes well, you're all going to come out hurt and hopefully not injured. Like that was the thing. And if you want it, DM me, right? So they DM me, no video, nothing, right? Because we've never had a class. 12 dudes signed up, they each paid 12 grand. First class, we had two guys quit, ring the bell and quit. But that was the beginning of the project, the Modern Day Night Project. And I realized when these guys came out, they were better entrepreneurs. They were better fathers, better spouses. They let go of all their vices. Every single one of them told me in the following 90 days after graduating the project that what registered as a level eight, nine, or 10 on the stress level, Richter scale of life, now life stresses registered at a two or a three. And I go, are you telling me that your stress and anxiety thermostat was reset? They go, that's exactly what I'm telling you. And what I realized is we were able to come time collapse a lot of stress and pressure and mental toughness, emotional resilience in that 75 hours where they now go and they execute the business plan and the businessman is no longer gonna try and fuck it all up with their vices. During the 75 hours, we have a lot of teaching blocks as well. So it's not just 75 hours of pull the truck and do ice baths and carry logs and all that shit because no human can take that, right? As it is, some of these guys get rhabdo and they have to get carted off by an ambulance. Um, the guys that, by the way, do get carted off by an ambulance, they can come and retake the class. But those that quit by ringing the bell can never do that again. Um, so during these classes, we talk about things like toxic cognitions. What are the biggest traumatic events of your life? that have taken place, that are creating limiting beliefs in you, that are causing you to escape with drugs, alcohol, vices, pornography, infidelity, whatever, right? And so they're like, fuck, I didn't know I was gonna talk about that. You know, you just put a, a post up that said a Navy SEAL and a Marine, and you guys are gonna train me, I'm gonna be a better entrepreneur, mental toughness. I'm like, yeah, because if I talked about journaling about your life's trauma, no one's gonna come and pay me, right? right? So I baked in basically self-development and for lack of a better word, like almost working on your shit, like overcoming your limiting beliefs and, and the glass ceilings that force you to self-sabotage and all these things. I baked into that, into the project. Well, as classes went on, and we're actually next month running our 19th class. So it's been five years, 19 classes. The class this is, is all in California, right? All California, mm -hmm. yeah. And now the classes are 35, 40 men big when they start, and we have an attrition rate of about 40%. So 40% of them either ring the bell and quit during the project or they get carted off by an ambulance. Um, and those that quit never quit because it was too hard physically. Uh -huh. It was mentally overwhelming. They didn't know how many more times they're going in the ice bath or how many more yards they're crawling in the pit or how many Ooh. more times they're going to pull the truck. And it's the unknown that gets them to have a meltdown and quit. Those that I, so I'm Papa Bear, so I always try and get them to, hey, just quit after the next evolution. Go one more evolution, one more hour. Just quit after we feed you lunch, right? Mm -hmm. Those that listen, make it to the 75 hours. Those that don't, they go limbic and like, fuck it, I'm quitting, I don't have to be here. And they just start fucking whacking the bell and you're out. Um, so as men started to graduate the project, these guys were coming along and like, hey, I've got a son. You know, 
what can I do to teach him the stuff that you guys taught us? I was like, shit, I don't know. But I'd read this book many years ago when uh, my son Andrew was born. Um, my uncle gave me a book called Raising a Modern Day Knight. I forget the author's name, but it's a great book about how to raise a young man to be a modern day knight. Chivalrous, um, a, a savage and a servant to humanity, know how to fight, but know when not to, etc. And so I read the book, I was like, shoot, I can create a squire program, basically, because knights have squires, and mm -hmm. the knight's job is to teach the squire how to be a, how to be a man. And so I, I create the squire program, and this thing blows up. Fathers and sons come, so about 50 fathers and sons will come, 25 sons, 25 fathers will come for 12 hours. They go through a hard evolutions, one after another, so everything from the project, but no bell to ring, no one's quitting, we're not you know, beating the shit out of them. And there's some desk time as well, learning time as well, bonding time, it's a rite of passage for a young man. And then we're hearing from the dads now going, holy crap, I brought my son because I thought it was like his rite of passage into manhood, and not only did he evolve, but I learned so much, this is something I needed as a kid, I healed so much. And so then we would have women reach out to us and go, hey, you're doing this thing called the project. You're doing this thing called the Squire program. It's all for men and sons and boys and dads. What about us? So then I created the Masogi. The Masogi is basically 12 hours, co-ed, same kind of beatdown as the project, minus, well, we get very foul and mean at the project. Right. <laughs> right. It's yeah. very, very, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, seen, I've seen the excerpts. Yeah. So... The, the Masogi is co-ed, and so we created some. But I realized the world needs mental toughness. The yes. world needs emotional resilience. The world needs grit. Life has gotten so soft, so comfortable, so convenient. Why do you think that is? Well, it's just because, you know, as humans, what do we do? We try and create convenience for ourselves, right? Like, look what you did. You created an awesome corporate office, and you're like, wait a minute. If I just put the gym here inside, I don't have to get in my car to go and train my people at a different gym. Right. Hey, if I put my podcast room... Also in my corporate office. I mean, it is more convenient, yep. right? Therefore, more comfortable sure. for Hani to not get in his car. So now Hani has to go and do hard shit. And I know you yeah. well enough to know you do hard shit because you always want to maintain your edge. Right. But it's human nature to create apps and comfortable chairs with lumbar support and this, that, and the other. And before you know it, we just become these gelatinous masses yep. that are always bubble wrapped and looking for the easiest path of convenience. Well, the caveman... He had to figure out how to start fire with like wet wood and he's going to like spark something like two stones together to create fire. Then he needs water. So he's going to hollow out a stump, a log, and then fight some saber toothed tiger to get to the river, fill up that, you know, makeshift bucket with water and get it back to his cave so he could feed his little family water and have some fire and fight off the saber tooth. Like they had built in challenges. Right. And there's a quote that I heard many years ago that said, adversity introduces a man to his highest self, which is absolutely true. It is in adversity, it is in hardship that you will meet the highest version of Hani, that I'll meet the highest version of Pedros. Viktor Frankl in his book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, he literally wrote that book while he was in a concentration camp, right? Um, at Ostwich, and as his wife was killed in the gas chambers, as he saw his friends killed, and he just, like, he, there was this part where he was about to get in line to go to the gas chamber, then he somehow got saved because he came up with the story uh, where, hey, you know, don't you need me to build, you know, dig that trench? You know what? Yeah, you are able-bodied. Yeah, build that, dig that trench. We'll kill you tomorrow, right? And every day he went on, he was able, to, and the war ended, and obviously he was saved, but he wrote that book. Viktor Frankl wrote that book, and the book is a byproduct of the adversity that he faced, losing his wife, seeing his friends die in gas chambers, Hitler's gas chambers. That book would never have come about if this guy who's a psychotherapist lived a regular life. Right. He would have still served people with the therapy that he does, but he discovered the higher version of himself, and that is man's search for meaning. Like, what is our purpose in life? And so for us to discover that, we need that. Well, for entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. hardship is already built into it because you have a plan, and as soon as you start, the plan is fucked up, and <laughs> you need more money, you need more time, you need better employees, you need, need, need. Uh, so this is why I created these things. So since I've got all my companies on autopilot, because I've got great leaders and CEOs and VPs running them, I've always been great with creating companies, products, people, mm -hmm. and processes. I was like, what can I do to help people on this side of it? Instead of helping them make money, helping them build the other part that they need, which is mental toughness, emotional resilience, grit, decisiveness, 
all those muscles have atrophied since we've gotten too convenient and life's gotten too comfortable. It's soft. Yeah, and that's where I created all these experiential events. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's really good because I think that there's something to be said about the mental and physical. And I feel like people go, I want to be mentally tougher. And I really feel like you have to be physically tougher first. Yes. And that's where I think that you don't, sometimes people want to put the cart before the horse. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the things because through evolution, and I think you believe in the same thing, is that we had that, right? We yeah. had that. Like, why do we have so much anxiety now? Why do we have all of these issues? Because of social media, because of sitting there on the phone, not having enough exercise. I mean, we were meant to be going out and hunting and, and foraging. and Hunting or being hunted. Right. And, and we needed that. And as kids, we played cops and robbers. Right. 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 Th that all stopped. And, but yet the desire is still within. And so when you can't fulfill that desire, then we get anxious, we get depressed, we get overwhelmed and, right. you know, we go, or you, or, you're, or you have ADD or you have ADD. <laughs> right? That's just your body yeah. saying that you need yeah. more, you need to be able to expend that yeah. energy. And people always like have meltdowns on me when I go all these things like anxiety, depression, you know, large amounts of self-diagnosed ADD overwhelm these are all first world problems so you go to armenia where i come from yep. third world country which is now evolving but you go to parts of africa which are very third world they don't have anxiety and depression and all that shit they're too busy trying to live they're being hunted or they're hunting they're trying to literally find food they're trying to find fire they're trying to find clean water right they don't even have a peanut allergy why do our kids have a peanut allergy or yeah. lactose intolerance or lactose intolerance <laughs> they're like yeah. right yeah, we can drop bags of... of, of <laughs> or gluten shit. intolerance. Yeah, yeah. It's all first world problems. Yeah, you know, I know about that one. Right? Because, yeah, yeah, it, it really is. It yeah. really and is. people have a hard time accepting that. No, no, no. I believe that maybe 1% of the hum human species here in the States probably has clinical anxiety. 1% probably have clinical di uh, uh, depression. The rest of it is all self-induced and self-inflicted because you're too busy screen sucking. You're too busy looking for convenience and comfort and not chasing your meaning and purpose in life. Right. Not doing anything hard. You don't feel like a productive member of society. You don't feel like you're contributing. The God or the higher power has instilled this need for us to contribute and to, to, to be a productive member of society. And when we don't, the way God or the universe knocks on your door and reminds you, hey, you're not doing what you should be doing, is through your conscience. And it's your conscience shows up as anxious, depressed, overwhelmed, uh, unfulfilled. And instead of answering that call, what do we do? Well, let me drink more. Let me screen suck more. Let me binge watch more TV or social media. And we go back to escaping from it instead of doing something about it. Yeah. Well, you know, do you think that right now with the situation at hand, people need to do, is it, is it more of that physical exertion or do you think that it's a combination of that and self-help i mean like when i say self-help is it is it reading more books or getting some of that knowledge because if you have generation after generation of softness it's like where do you go i mean, you know there's you there's there's there, you know there's andy there's hormozy there's people out there that are putting out some amazing information and i feel like is it you know what if you came from a family that didn't have that father figure, right. right? Or you didn't have that person to be able to kind of help lead the, the thought process and say no, or you come from something where the opposite happens. And I have family members that are like this, where you know they turn around and you've over insulated your kids. right? And then you turn around and wanna know why they're soft and why is it that they're having problems and they don't have coping skills. Yeah. Do you think that it's just, is, what's the best way to do that? You think fitness. It's always fitness. Starting out with fitness. Always. always. Okay. If someone's like, hey, man, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm suffering in, in business, in my marriage, in my mindset, and I, 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 I don't know what else to do. What do I do? I'm like, get lean and jacked. And I have a podcast episode that blew up, and it was called Fitness is the Gateway Drug. Mm -hmm. Fitness is the gateway drug to the higher self because that is the only thing you have direct control over. Like, I can't control. I can probably put up the best post, and I can have my team run the best ad, for my franchise Fit Body Boot Camp, and I can probably have the ambassadors post the best stuff, but I don't know if we're gonna end up selling more franchises from those ads and posts or not, right? Mm -hmm. But I do know that after this podcast, I'm gonna change into my shorts and my workout clothes. I'm gonna go and like 
bring the fucking thunder in your gym. Right. And I'm gonna work out no matter how fucking tired I am. I can control my effort. I can control my energy, every set, every rep, every weight that I, and then I'm gonna control what goes in my pie hole. Yeah. So I can absolutely control the outcome of this physique. And when I see the fat melt and the muscles come out and the definition and the rippling muscles, I'm like, you know what? I start falling in love with that guy. That's just on the physical. And then on the chemical side, well, fuck, you can probably say better than I can. And all the dopamines, the endorphins mm -hmm. that are released when you're working out. And then when you're driving home from the gym, you're just like, fuck, I did something that less than 1% of the population does. Like, look at me. I just feel good about myself. Like, there's no, they make drugs to try and mimic what your body can actually produce. But it has to be produced through the effort and the outcome that you can. So fitness is the gateway drug. Because you can read your way to as many books about self-help and overcoming trauma, et cetera, but it's until you take action, which is why when Tony Robbins says the fastest way to change your state, mental state, is to change your physical state, right? He says, go out and do 100 burpees or do hill sprints or change your physical state and your, your mental state will follow. So I'm in line with what you said and science proves it that fitness is the gateway drug to the higher self, to the better self. And you mentioned Anthony Robbins, right? Tony Robbins. Uh, do you feel like Again, I, I'm not really dialed into him, but I know there's some people who had some amazing opportunities to go out and be part of the weekends. What do you feel is, I mean, I don't know if you have relationships with any of these guys, because I know you guys go out on tour, right? Andy yeah. goes out and hits a lot of, um, I know he was in Salt Lake not that long ago, and some of the speakers get together and do these events. Is it? Is do you think there's a lot of fake gurus out there when it comes to this motivational side? Because yeah. I know in the fitness side, there's tons of them, right? Everybody yeah. Yeah. who had maybe gotten a diet from somebody tries to resell it to somebody. So it's a lot of recycled bullshit. Yeah. Do you feel like in your space, same thing. it's the same thing same with the thing. coaching and the motivational Business speaking? Business coaching or motivational speaking. And I, and I can tell you this, and Andy and I have texted about this before. Like, you'll be in a green room and you could just be like, this motherfucker. Like, wait, you want to go where after the speaking event? What strip club? And then they're on stage talking about God and Jesus and whatever. And I'm not here to shit on people, right. but fucking let me tell you, if, if you push me enough, I'll start dropping names because I don't care. Uh, but by all means, feel free. The guys, are the, 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 you know, yeah. they're, they're, the, they're, the, 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 the point I'm making is there is a lot of fake gurus everywhere. And I believe the right. Pareto principle stands true, right? The 80-20 rule. And I believe of any industry, there's probably 20% who will actually walk to walk and talk to talk. Yep. Coaches, trainers, yep. mm -hmm. right? And then there's the 80% who will... Because look, you can go buy the blue check mark for 14 bucks a month. Right. You can go buy a whole bunch of fake followers. Right. And when I say, I'm not even talking bots anymore. You can, you know, from Africa and Sao Paulo, Brazil, young kids will follow you if you do a, a iPhone giveaway. You know, there's companies that will do an iPhone giveaway. You, you pony up the money for the iPhone. They'll put on all these big pages. Hey, this person's giving away an iPhone. Go follow them. Now you got, whatever, 2 million young kids trying to get an iPhone from a third world country. And so they're going to follow you. Okay. So you can have the blue check mark. You can have real humans following you, although they're never going to spend money. You can change, you know, put that little drop down uh, that says public figure. Okay. Even though you've done nothing to be a fucking public figure, you've done nothing in terms of self work to develop to your higher self, to have some higher understanding, go from human animal to human being. And then you could uh, make cool videos. You can make cool videos with your iPhone of how awesome you are, and you can maybe even go rent a Bugatti or whatever and flash <laughs> in front of it. My point right. is, it's easier than ever. The barrier to becoming a fake coach, fitness coach, business coach, mindset coach, you name the coach, is easier than ever. The barrier is lower than ever. And so, in fact, you said Salt Lake. Next month in April, I'm in uh, Salt Lake at that event, speaking on stage with Tony Robbins and some of those other big names. Uh, last year, I couldn't make it, uh, the one that Andy spoke at, because I had a, uh, another event that I was speaking at. And so uh, Dan and Keaton, who run that event, it's the Limitless event, uh, asked me to speak at it, and it's, I'm more than happy to. But I've been in enough green rooms mm -hmm. with enough dudes where I just... I can smell who's real and who's not. Like I can tell who's lost money, who's made money, who's got the chops and who's just flashing and faking. Um, and the people that have been around long enough can as well. Yeah. So the person that comes to mind and I've never met him before, but I'm sure you have David Goggins. Yeah. Right. What's your take on someone like David? <laughs> I think the guys are fucking as legit as they come. When, when someone can go, Hey, here's who I was. You know, you read any of his books, like, Can't Hurt Me. Yeah. Um, here's who I was, a fat fuck. I, I, he was a fat fuck who was an exterminator, you know, spraying shit down at restaurants when they closed to kill bugs and stuff. And he'd have a big fat milkshake and hamburgers and shit. Um, and then he would watch a 
you know, History Channel documentaries, he says, on what a Navy SEAL does. And he's like, fuck it, I'm going to go be that guy, right? And then he was like, fuck it, I'm going to be that, I'm going to be an Army Ranger, I'm going to be a fuck. So he, like, went and checked off every op special operations thing on the planet. Uh, like, there's a guy who's, like, the real deal in that capacity, mm -hmm. in that capacity. Now, do I think everyone should go out and be a David Goggins? No. Do I think everyone should go out and try and create a business like I have, right? Like, you know a nine figure business, a multiple eight figure business and take equity in 12 different companies that are scaling. And no, like I play like David Goggins does what he does at the highest level, right? I do what I do. Andy does what he does at the highest level. Right. You do what you do. Like you're about to go train a uh, hottie out there. Yep. Dude, some guy who doesn't have your chops and your eye and your ability, if they work with a Olympia level athlete like that, they'll fuck them all up. Yep. And, and he's not going to show well at, at, at the Arnold. Right. Um, and so there's people like us who play at the highest level. We're examples of, hey, here's, if I did this in business, then you could do that. If David Goggins went from this to this nutty guy who's like just deciding, I'm going to wake up this morning and run a marathon on the streets of wherever he lives. I think it's somewhere out of, uh, outside of Las Vegas. Um, then surely you can wake up and maybe run five miles, right? Yeah. And I think people think that I need to be like David Goggins. I need to be like Andy. I need to be like Bedros. I need to be like Hani. No, no. If we're the extreme examples of what yeah. we can do in our world, then maybe you could do something in more than what you're doing now to elevate yourself, your vibrational frequency. Yeah, and that, that's, that's a key word. Because, you know, a lot of people who've been listening to me now for the last couple of years, I talk about vibrational frequency. Mm -hmm. And just to reiterate what that is... Um, I guess, let me ask you in your terms, what, what do you consider that so that the listeners can understand yeah. what that is in terms of definition? Um, in fact, your listeners, if they Googled uh, human vibrational frequency and then they click on Google images, they'll find a what looks like a pyramid, a chart. And at the very bottom of the chart, you'll see the lowest vibrational human frequency because we all vibrate at a certain frequency. Yep. There they are. Yep. We all vibrate. And you see shame, guilt, and apathy are at the very lowest vibrational frequency in terms of mm -hmm. what is it megahertz or whatever the highest vibrational frequency enlightenment peace joy love now look where acceptance is in the upper one third yep. right so if someone's feeling shame guilt grief regret if you could just accept the fact that i fucked up if you could accept it you go from 20 vibrational frequency to 400 right Acceptance is the magical number. People are trying to get to enlightenment and peace. That's not where to get to. If you're in that lower frequency number of life, yep. accept the fact that, you know, I've been a lazy, fat slob, too convenient, choosing convenience and comfort over everything else, breaking promises to myself, not doing what I should be doing in life. Let me accept this. By accepting this, instead of constantly beating yourself up, you increase your vibrational frequency. Once you go, I accept this, and now I'm going to make a change, you can start at that 400 and start working your way up. Right. And that's what we need to do. But we all vibrate on a vibrational frequency. Uh, it's measured. It's been documented. And I'm one of those people. I'm very impressionable. Uh -huh. And so I always tell the people around me, like, if I come in contact with someone that's like low energy, low vibe, we've all been to yeah. an event where you meet someone and you're like, and they uplift your energy. You're like, fuck, they're brand new. I don't know anything about them other than this interaction, but that's someone I want to get to know. Same deal. You meet someone, and after a 10-minute conversation, you just feel like a wet blanket was thrown on you. Yep. Well, I met both of you for 10 minutes. Why is it that with Honey, my, I feel like I can just fucking run through a wall right now. Right. With this other guy, I feel like I need to just, like, stab myself in the heart and just bleed out. Right? right. Well, one lowered my vibrational frequency. And one raised it. One raised it. Right. And I'm very impressionable, and so I know that if I don't curate my circle of influence, I will end up adjusting to the people around me. Yep. And so you have to be ruthless with the people you keep in your circle. And I think that's the hard part. And that's... that's For peasant-minded people, it is. Yeah, yeah. And I, I you know, because <laughs> you're, you're keeping it real. For me, I think that it's hard because when you have family members, right? Because family is the one that you don't choose. They, you're part of it. And you have negative energy. You have negative vibrational frequency. Yes, sir. And they're a part of your family. Mm -hmm. You're living under their roof and you're listening to this podcast and you're in your teens or you're in your early 20s. And, the, you know, you have to kind of follow the rules of the house. Sure. They don't want you to do bodybuilding and they don't want to be. I, I grew up in that. Right. 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 I, I had to be the typical Persian 
you're going to be a lawyer or you're going to be a doctor. We prefer doctor, lawyer, if you can't handle it right, and you're right. retarded. And, you know, I don't even want to use that word, but it's just like, whatever. You can't handle it. That's fine. Right. Because then you can drop out of biochemistry yeah. or, you know, organic chemistry like my friends did when we were over at UCSB and they became lawyers. Right. And my mom was the one that was like the consummate, like, oh, you know, my uncle is a a veterinarian. My mom was a, was a teacher. My, my uncle was a professor, uh, in a very big college in Germany. Um, doctors, a lot of doctors in our family. And the crazy thing about it was, was that bodybuilding was considered like, it's like almost like being a construction worker. Right. Right. Well, it's so obscure. Right. Well, so weird if you don't know it. And, and it's almost like, it's very narcissistic. Sure. So when you're looking at it, and you're trying to, you, you come from a household of very educated people. They look at it and they're like, okay, you can work out to be healthy, but if you want to look at yourself and take your shirt off, it's a very narcissistic right. thing. So we don't want you to be a part, like part of that right. community, that culture or anything. But if it's for health, great. Because my mom got me a gym membership when I was 13 because she was like, I need you to, to ha be more active and I want you to be able to go use this pool at this local gym. So she signed me up for this three year, you know, those things that come yeah. in the mail, the mailers that yeah, used yeah, to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, she- Was she, it Bally's Total Fitness by no, chance? No, it was no. this little hole in the wall. It was called Anastasia's. It was in Campbell, California. Yeah. And I rode my bike there. Yeah. And uh, I remember me and my mom went there for the first time and we got a tour and it was like 350 bucks for like three years. Yeah. It was this amazing deal. Smoking deal. Smoking deal, small place. And it had a pool. And so she walks by and she sees all the, you know, the girls in the aerobics room. And then on the right, there's weights. And then she's like, okay, is there a pool? And then there's an old Asian man that owned it. It was like Mr. Miyagi. The right. guy was like, literally looked like Mr. Miyagi. Yeah. And, uh, and people who are listening to this that know that gym, that when it was around, they're going to say testament to the guy that owned it. And we'd go all the way to the back and there was an outdoor pool. There was an outdoor jacuzzi and an outdoor pool. And she's like, oh, and people are doing laps. And she says, okay. I want you to, I'm going to sign you up. You're going to come over here four days, five days a week, and you're going to use the pool and you can ride your bike here. And this is what you're going to do. And she's like, there's a bike rack in the back and you're going to go in there. And is it okay with you? And then, you know, I, I'm like, oh, he'll never do it because I'm only 13. Right. And he's like, oh yeah, just <laughs> pay the money. The guy's like, didn't even matter. Right. right. He's like, just pay the money. And man, I was there almost every day, yeah. every day. And then one day I saw a bunch of big Samoans in the gym yeah. and they're like, Hey, bro, bro, come over here. Well, you know, you come in, come yeah. in, try to, you know, come and work out with us. And I, bro, know. Samoans, when when they decide to lift, yeah, and eat clean, forget about it. Massive. Yeah, these guys didn't eat that clean because they were it. huge. Yeah, yeah. But they were all ball players, so they were playing like at San Jose State, yeah. and they were they were they were um, college ball. Yeah. And a couple of them were like juniors, seniors in high school. But you know, Samoans are just naturally just big, right. big guys, and so. I found my way in there, but but the whole point was that there's this whole gym thing in the community of the Persian community. It was only because of the fact that she's like, I need you to have more exercise. I don't want you to get jammed up on the Nintendo or whatever it was. Right. And you know, we would go out and play, but there was some times where she was like, Look, you're you're playing, but some of your friends have moved away, and then you know, maybe you need to go and do something extracurricular. Mm -hmm. And then when I went in there, that's how I started bodybuilding actually, gotcha. is that I ended up going into the gym because I wanted to play football and it was going to be freshman year coming up. How did your parents feel about you playing football? Not at all. They oh, thought it was crazy. They're yeah. like football, like soccer. Right. And I'm like, no, no, no and my dad used American to be a soccer football. coach. Yeah. Exactly. And I was like, I, oh, I hated it. Cause when I tried to play soccer, two reasons. Number one, I liked the physical piece of it, like right. the hitting. Right. But I also was never good at running because I didn't know at the time I had asthma. And so when I was running around, I was like, God, man, I, can, I have short bursts of energy. I was good. So that's why I was really good and excelled at football. Yeah. But when I had to run around for extended periods of time, right. and I also felt it when I was when I was wrestling in high school, and I would just get gassed. And it was because I had asthma, and I didn't figure, figure it out until later on when I almost graduated. The by beauty then. of being an immigrant, yep. by the way. Yeah. yeah, and I'm just like, oh, asthma, what is that? Yeah. They're like, oh, you just have allergies. Right. You have, you know, honey, take it, uh, take a Claritin, you right. know? Right. 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 You know, and I'm just like, no, this is yeah. like a this real is, this thing. This is more than Claritin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was funny because that was the whole thing, but the whole purpose was that it took a long time for my parents to accept it. And to just circle back on the whole thought process, when you have family members, especially parents, who 
we're controlling where you live, you know, that you're under their right. roof, you're under their rules and they're not supportive of things. And I feel like every parent should be supportive. If a child wants to get into fitness, especially if they want to get into some kind of bodybuilding. Now they don't have to go out there and do cycles of drugs or anything like that. I'm just, you know, again, I, I competed as a natural bodybuilder the whole time I competed, right. but if, you get in your 20s and you decide, hey, look, man, I want to go off and do a cycle, then that's up to you. You're a grown-ass person. You're an adult. You make the decision. But understanding that the discipline of becoming a bodybuilder becomes a part of a, a rite of passage, mm -hmm. in my opinion. So, like, you have those 75 hours, yep. right, that those hell hours that they're going out there and you're doing, like, your bud-style training – well, that's how it is for 12 to 15 weeks when you're doing a bodybuilding show. Yeah. Because what you're willing to do is what 99.99% .99 of people are not, which is the mental toughness to get your ass out of bed, do fasted cardio every day, to make sure you're eating six meals a day and you're hitting all your macros. You're making sure that you're hitting your posing, your training, you know, going out and tanning and doing every little thing that you're supposed to do to be able to get for this one point in time yeah. to do absolutely nothing compared to what you had to do to get there. None of the training actually is shown on there. Right. You're just showing the end result of the training in the nutrition. Which, by the way, when you say one point, at the, at, like it, you're precisely coming in on a specific day, a specific part of the That's day, right? right? It's, it, it is like a, a dark game, man. I and mean, you, know, you guys have made it a science what you do. But you're absolutely right to, to be able to come in that honed in because how often do we hear about people, oh, they peak three days later or they peak too early right. and then... No, it, it is tough. But I think that that's where I'm saying that physical challenge has to happen. Yeah. And that's what builds discipline. Yes. Arnold would say it all the time, right? He, you know, why is he so successful? Because he took all the components of doing that where he eventually led the fifth largest uh, economy in the world, um, turned around, said, I'm going to become this, you know, the most iconic actor. Mm -hmm. And he became the most iconic at least when it comes to adventure and action right. actor in the world. And then you turn around and then become the governor of California and tons of businesses, tons of real estate, real estate mogul, business mogul. Now he's, you know, feeding his pet donkey every week right. on, on Instagram because he's bored. But, you know, and we're going to see him in a couple of days here. But the bodybuilding has been able to do that. And I think that's why people who perform at a high level, like special forces guys, right? Especially like there's people that go into the military and then there's special forces guys. Right. And how I distinguish the two is that there's an enlistee and then there's like somebody that goes and gets a membership at a gym and then there's a guy that gets ready for a show. Right. And somebody who gets ready for a show and competes is special forces. Well, that's a really well-defined word picture. I love that. That's exactly right. And in my space. And, yeah. that's, and then you turn around and you're like, well, who's a Green Beret? Well, those guys that are getting ready at the very elite that are able to reproduce it over and over and over again, that's who you call, yeah. right? That's SEAL Team 6. That's the guys that go in there, right, and are yeah. the tip of the spear. And But there's a lot of guys that own gym memberships, and they go into the military. But they go in, and they just kind of like, you know, and God bless them all, but I'm just saying, right. to be able to be that high, right. high-level producer that is going to be able to do that. And I think that's why you enjoy working with the people you do because they're willing to go above and beyond because they've yeah. done that in the past. They just need the coaching. There's predictability in how they're going to show up, whether they come from special operations or they come from pro athletes. So Steve Weatherford was a coaching client. He's a Super Bowl winning champion. Yeah, I know Steve. I got to work with mm -hmm. Bill Heath, obviously. I had yeah. the good fortune to, to, to work with you with, with what you're um, about to launch in the near future. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're working with all these high speed, like doesn't matter if it's, from, they come from sports, entrepreneurship, or military. Like, I can define them by saying high speed, tightly wound, goal focused, intense. Like, every single one of you, every single one of us. And so, what do I know about these people? Well, disciplined, focused, delayed gratification, consistency. That's what it takes to be a pro level bodybuilder. That's what it takes to be a high level entrepreneur. That's what it takes to be in special operations or special forces. That's what it takes to be a Super Bowl winning champion. Those four things discipline, delayed gratification, focus, consistency. It's you know time under tension. We can go do the best workout on the planet. Like you can put me through the best workout on the planet today. Right. Uh, I'm not going to look like hottie out there. Right. Now, if we did that for a prolonged period of time and use those four things, then I might have a chance. Sure. Right. And same thing in business and, and everything else. And I think that's what people are forgetting is when we talk about fitness being the gateway to why Arnold was able to translate bodybuilding into television, 
movies, into entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. into being the governor of the fifth largest economy, economy in the nation, which uh, at the time was California. It's not by accident. Right. Everything he learned in the gym, he just applied everywhere else. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that's where that discipline comes in. Is there anybody right now when you were coming up that you were looking up to when you were doing your journey through your entrepreneurship? Um, so my, my mentor, Jim Franco, he actually was a personal training client and I was in my early twenties and had these, uh, this, this grand vision of being an entrepreneur, owning my own personal training studios. Uh -huh. But at the time I was working at LA fitness as a $12 and 50 cent an hour personal trainer. Um, what and, year was that? Oof, uh, 1999, 2000, 2001. Oh. Yeah. And Which in the grand scheme of things was not that long ago. No, no, no. And and Jim Franco was in his mid sixties. In fact, is that him? Holy shit, that's Jim Franco, man. Yeah, <laughs> that is him. The boys are good at doing this up. He, you guys got to make sure up. you put that up on the podcast. Oh my God, dude, that is Jim Franco, and that is me. Uh, four months ago at his 80th birthday. So, oh wow, he has he looks great my, for 80, dude, dude. He he has been my. And this is when I put him on my podcast. I said, Jim, I want to put you on my podcast. He goes, kid, what? He still calls me, kid, what's a podcast? I'm like, just, just show up to this address, right? It's my corporate office. <laughs> right. And he shows up. He's like, holy fuck, you made it, you know? Uh, he's got all daughters. Uh -huh. And so he always looked at me as a son. But he was my personal training client. And uh, God, I love that man. He's my rich dad. So I've got my poor dad, who I love to pieces. Like, we escaped communism. We escaped the Soviet Union. My dad, and he brought us here for freedom and opportunity. But Jim Franco was my rich dad, like Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And Franco was that guy who saw something in me during the personal training sessions and decided to pour into me. He was very harsh with his words, uh, but I was like, Jim, how's it that you drive a Cadillac Escalade one day and you show up with the Mercedes the next day? He goes, kid, you can have as many cars as you want. And I was like, I can? At the time I was driving a 79 Toyota pickup that was always breaking down. So I was like, I didn't even realize you could have as many cars as you want. And well, what do you do for a living? I'm a CEO. What the fuck is a CEO, Jim? Well, I own a company. So if you own a company, why are you here three days a week at 2.30 in the afternoon? He goes, as the CEO, you put people in charge and you can leave whenever you want. You can? Like, it was like, like he was just popping my cherry left and right. Uh -huh. um, and so I was like, dude, what do I need to do to get out of this $12.50 an hour job that I have as a personal trainer and own my own personal training studio? He goes, well, kid, first of all, you need to learn to sell. And here's how stubborn I was, honey. I was like, I beg to differ, Jim. You came in here looking for personal training, and I sold you a six-month training package three times a week. He goes, no, you didn't. You're just an order taker. No different like a, than a waitress. And he didn't say waiter. He said waitress, right? Like he really wanted to like, like move the knife. <laughs> he was really trying to yeah. fuck with you. I go, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, I knew I wanted to work out three days a week. The options that you gave me were six months and 12 months. I, put, I picked six months. But I already knew coming in here I want a personal trainer. He just filled my order no different than a restaurant waitress mm -hmm. would take an order. She's not going to convince someone to buy food. They're there to buy food. They're hungry. He goes, but what I see you do is a lot of people walk away from you and they give you objections and you literally buy their objections. Like they need to go think about it, talk to their spouse, count their money. They'll be back tomorrow with an answer. And he goes, be backs will never come back. I didn't know any sales. I was just like, I'm in great shape. I work out. Can I train you? And if you were going to looking already for a personal trainer, you're a lay down, I would sell you. But because of that, I only had four personal training clients. So I was, I was also a busboy at uh, Disneyland at Carnation Cafe and a bouncer at a gay bar because the gay bar paid more than the straight bar. Um, gay bar in Buena Park, California called Oz. So I'm working as a bouncer, uh, fry, uh, fry cook and busboy at Disneyland, and then also a personal trainer. So Jim Franco decides he's going to take me under his wing and start mentoring me. And ultimately, when he felt like I had the chops of what it took to be an entrepreneur, he loaned me $50,000 wow. at 8% interest. Now, here's how, sh how much of a shark, shark that old man is. Um, and I love him the pieces for it. He said, after you pay me back at 8%, I'm still your 50% business partner. I was like, yes, sir. Like, that's it's like you're with Mr. Wonderful. Yeah, there, yeah, man. yeah, exactly. He <laughs> like, like the he, shark he was, tank. He was the first Kevin O'Leary, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, but it was because of him that I was able to open up five personal training studios throughout San Diego, California. Wow. I ended up selling those. They were called Premier Results. Ended up selling those to a big national brand uh, that came through and ended up selling those and realizing that, oh shit, as an entrepreneur, you can build a business, sell it, create another one, build it, sell it. You can create as many as you want. And then as social media came about, and I was like, oh, I can build a brand. I could be a brand. Whoa. 
and my eyes were opened. And, and, you know, when I invited him to come do my podcast, um, he was just blown away. Get this. The dude has so much influence on me. Years later, I bought a Nissan GTR because I've mm -hmm. always loved like fast race cars. And I bought a Nissan GTR. Before that, during once I had my personal training studios, I bought, he had a Cadillac Escalade, like I told you. So I went and bought a GMC Yukon Denali, mm -hmm. which was basically GM makes it, but it's the GM's version of the Escalade. Like that's how much influence Franco has had on me, Jim Franco. So then years later, during this era where these pictures are taken, um, I've got a, a, a Nissan GTR. And so he pulls up. And he walks in, he goes, Kit, who's, whose GTR is that? I'm like, mine. He goes, you're not going to believe this. Come outside, look what I pulled up in. He pulled up in a white Nissan GTR, and I have a silver one, That's right? It's fucking nuts, dude. Like, the dude has so much influence on me that I was, like, thinking like him when I years later went out and bought a sports car. Um, and, and so, you know, when you have someone who's been such a big influence on you, and years since then I've gotten mentors, I realize, like, I can pay for progress. Like, why do I need to go train and figure out how my body works when I can hire the best and you're gonna tell me how to train, how mm -hmm. to eat, what to do to get the results, avoiding injuries, getting yeah. faster results and achieving my outcomes. So I've always felt like all coaches need coaches. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Jim Franco was my first mentor and since then I've paid for mentors from speaking coaches, um, to improv coaches, to marketing, sales, you name it. Uh, and to me, it's been literally the cheat code for achieving greater success in life. Yeah, and I think that's just, very similar. There you go with your GTRs. Yes, yes, that's exactly it. Yeah. You, want, you want to hear something funny? Tell me. So my wife has a GTR. You know, I mean, she basically commandeered mine many years yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I stopped tracking it. Yeah, okay. And, and you know, I, I started tracking my Viper, and I, it was probably death machine Viper. I yeah. Well, the, yeah. the the ACR is much more right. stable. But Two thousand pounds of downforce, by the yeah, way. That yeah. Yeah. Wing. Yep. It's crazy. But the funny thing about it is that. That was the original color. It was more like a, mine's like a gunmetal gray. Yep. And then she wrapped it in Evogen blue before, and then she just wrapped it in white. That's and awesome. so now it's at the house in white. How cool um, is that? But it's a, it's, a, it's a really, really cool car and a cool story. And another thing to complement to your story is that I have friends that I came up with coaching and very similar. They, you know, they didn't have kids, they were married, couple, a little bit older. Good friend of mine, his name is John Woody. And God, I've known John forever. And um, he's actually, I talked to him last night. He's going to come out here to Dallas because he hasn't seen the building yet. And uh, he just is 70 years old and retired. Just they, him and his wife just sold their, their company. And then he was also an executive. He was over at um, a software company. Did was a very, very successful guy. I, I coached him for many, many years. And he ended up opening up a gym up in Oregon when he moved up there. And uh, with his trainer yeah. that was up there. Yeah. And so what's crazy about it is the fact that he was a person that has always helped me with just being able to bounce ideas off of. And again, like a like an uncle. Right. Yeah. And the, you turn around and be like, hey, look, I, you know, I want to get that perspective and was able to always give that perspective. And there's been a couple of people in my life that's been able to do that as I was you know, growing up. And these people that I've noticed was that. When I look back and I see, and I have friends that were in the personal training space, mm -hmm. everybody has at least one, one that believed in them to the point where they would invest right. in some way, shape or form, whether it's time, money or both. But even Mark Mastroff, right. Mark Mastroff, I used to work for Mark Mastroff back in 1993 as a personal trainer right out of high school. And Mark, for those that don't know who he is, He's the founder of 24 Hour Fitness mm -hmm. and ended up opening up a ton of clubs. I think now he owns Crunch, he owns UFC gyms, he owns a ton of gyms. But he was a personal trainer and to a guy named Leonard Schlem and a uh, very, very um, successful businessman. And he said, I wanted to open up a gym. And Leonard said, okay, we're going to be partners. I'm going to own 51%. You're going to own 49%. Yep. And you're going to be the operator, and I'm going to be the owner. And we're going to go ahead and do this. And then they started with one club up in San Ramon, up in the Bay Area. Yep. And then they ended up having two, then three. And by the time I worked for them, I think there was 13. Wow. And then it ended up becoming hundreds and hundreds. And, again, the story just they just yeah. blew it up. But it was all starting from a client and a trainer relationship. Yep. And 
all around the country, I guarantee you, around the world, you'll find those. Somebody who's a successful businessman or somebody who is in tech and then they just have some extra money and they believe in their personal trainer and he says, hey, you want to open up a studio? Let me go ahead and back you. Yeah. And you have these great opportunities to become an entrepreneur. But I feel that it, what's really cool is that um, very similar to your situation, you know, I've had some people like that. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really cool to be able to have some of that mentorship as you've grown up. You know what's funny, dude? You just you articulate things so well. Um, that a light, I had a light bulb moment as you're telling that story. And since you've got such a big platform, both on Instagram, YouTube, across all the platforms, and being who you are, <clears throat> the young men and women who watch and listen to you, they're obviously in fitness. That's probably the predominant reason they're following you. If So here's a message to them, because you made 100% sense. There's something sacred about the personal trainer and the client relationship. You would agree to that, right? Yes. There's something magical oh. and sacred because yes. now at the level that you're working at with athletes, you know, like they're savages. They come in here and they just need to go the extra mile, the extra inch, and you take them there and you have the outside eyes to coach them. But when you were a personal trainer working with regular people like I was, mm -hmm. you remember how intimidating it was for Mr. and Mrs. Joan Jones to come in and big box gym they're intimidated. People are clinging and banging the weights. There's mirrors. They don't want to see themselves in the mirrors. They're intimidated by the machines. They're intimidated by the free room, free weight room. And so if anything, I would always see clients or gym members do a couple of random machines, no program, no design, just a couple of random machines. They wouldn't even adjust the weights or the seats. And I'd look at them like, fuck, man, they're going to hurt themselves. And then they'd go to the juice bar, buy like a 400 calorie, 500 calorie smoothie and walk out. I'm like, you just put on more calories than you took off. But you know how sacred that relationship is because when they partner up with a personal trainer in a big box gym, that personal trainer starts teaching them that like, you do belong here. This is your gym as much as it is that jack guy or that jack chick. Mm -hmm. uh, you do belong in the free rate room, Mrs. Jones, on that squat rack, on that Smith machine. And you see the confidence build and you see the self-esteem build. And I've, had, I've worked with hundreds of clients in my days, uh, just rank and file people. And in that time, you would hear like, man, you know, my marriage kind of got better. It did? Why are you thanking me? I just help you lose weight and get fit. Well, the confidence from that allowed me to have a conversation with my husband about whatever, right? Or I was able to finally ask for a raise for my boss that I've been wanting for the last couple of years. And guess what? I got it. You did? Wow. Yeah. Because he said my whole outlook has changed since I've been working out and eating right. And I share that because any young man, a young woman listening to this right now, um, like if you're like, how, how do I find a great mentor? Well, my challenge to you would be that if you're listening to Hani's show and you like fitness anyway, go get certified as a personal trainer. Go and work as a one-on-one -on -one personal trainer, like in the trenches. Mm -hmm. The people that can afford one-on-one -on -one personal training, would you agree that they're pretty well-to-do people? Yes. Right? Yes. Because you're paying $600, 700 $1,000, $1,200 a month to work with a one-on-one -on -one personal trainer. You probably do well for yourself. So it's like now you're getting paid to have a mentor. I didn't realize that Jim Franco, I was getting paid to be mentored by this guy. And by the time I did, I was like, Jim, you're working out with me three days a week. You're giving me all this advice. You're bringing me books and tapes like Zig Ziglar books and Tom Hopkins and Jay Abraham. Can I train you a fourth day a week? And then maybe you can just take more time and tell me how to be a better entrepreneur. Like once I realized I've got a built-in mentor and I realized like, all these people want to find their path and they always reach out to me and like, I can't afford your $100,000 domination in your coaching program. Well, guess what? They listen to your show, honey. They have a passion for fitness. Go get certified as a personal trainer. Work in the trenches, working with affluent people one-on-one -on -one as a personal trainer. You will meet a mentor. You will meet several mentors. You will get paid to have several mentors. Ask a lot of questions in between sets. Give away a free session or two yep. in exchange for more consulting from them, more just them pouring into you. And watch how quickly you learn from well-to-do people, people who are entrepreneurs, people that have done it, and not just profess it. Like, like, talk about a cheat code for life if you're a young man or woman. 100%. I mean, like I said, I had a couple of them. I had my first show, I remember Kevin and Mary Ellen Devine, and they didn't have any kids at the time. I was getting ready for my first show as a teenager, and I'm going to do the San Diego. I'm living in San Jose. I'm going to do a, the a San Diego show. And they're like, when's your show? And I said, it's in four months. And they said, well, we want to come. 
next thing you know, you know, I'm training both of them three, four days a week. All of a sudden they're like, hey, we got the information. We booked our tickets. We did this. We booked your tickets. We put, they got us a suite. He was in charge of global travel for a small company called Applied Materials. I'm, I'm being sarcastic. It's a very large company. They make the, um, the chip making equipment for Intel. And he was in charge of their global travel budget. So when we went there, literally, it was first class all the way. They gave us the penthouse in San Diego at the Hyatt yeah. Regency that overlooks the bay. You know that Hyatt yeah, that's yeah, up there? Yeah. They gave us the whole thing. They put a treadmill and a bike in there for me. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to really do cardio the last right, two days, but, but I appreciate you. it. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. And it was all completely like because of who he is, they took really good care of him. Yeah. I mean, it was like a $99 room. that It was like a $2,000 a night, $3,000 a night room that was for 99 bucks. And then he's like, oh, no, 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 I'm taking care of this for you because wow. we're, we're kind of sponsoring you. Yeah. And I was just like, wait a minute, you didn't have to do any of this. But they were so just appreciative of what I helped them do that they wanted to be a part of my journey, get ready for my first show, and then also say, hey, yeah. there, I got, we had pictures together. We, you know, the whole weekend, we went out that night, the next day. It was a cool, cool t thing. And um, ended up just, they're fabulous people. And the crazy thing about it is that those types of relationships, man, you can't even pay for it. And they're paying you. Yeah. And like you said, you're sitting there getting that information that is so valuable, but they're now invested in your journey yeah. because especially if you're likable and you're positive and you're on the right frequency, yeah. then they want to turn around and then they go, look, I'm really, really liking this. I want to do more sessions. I'm going to tell my friends, I want to see you even more successful because they know as you're coming up, that you're just starting out. You're living at home. Right. You're 18, 19, 20 years old or in that space where you're still living at home, maybe can't afford a place or you can't afford a really nice car yet. And they just want to be a part of that solution yeah. because they feel like, hey, you know what? I really like, you're helping me. I want to help you. Let me give you some opportunities here. Yeah. And, and I guarantee you, everybody who's listening to this who's a personal trainer will have at least one person that they're going to think about right now and say, yeah, that's, that's one client. Yeah, that's my mentor. Yeah. That's the person. And this actually dovetails perfectly into the question that you asked and me so unprofessionally did not answer. So let me circle back to that question. You're like, so what do you do when you live in a household yeah. with low-frequency people, low-vibrational people, and you're under their rule, right? Yeah. And I, I think we just kind of went on to another topic. Yeah. But one, we could go and seek out, especially as personal trainers, these clients who are built-in mentors, right? One would argue it's not always, but more often than not, these people that are well off and doing well, more often than not are at a higher vibrational frequency. They've experienced life, they've been humbled, they know how life works. The more I give, the more I get. Uh, they're not selfish, they're service-driven. So one, spend more time with them. And the way you do that is by obviously training them, right? You give mm -hmm. them your time, your energy, your effort, your knowledge in exchange for money. And, and they also get to then want to see you thrive in your journey. But two, when you're living in a household, when you're under someone else's rule, and this is a lesson from my therapist, Kevin. So I got to give Kevin Downing a shout out. My therapist who, by the way, looks like uh, he's in his late sixties. He looks like Einstein, but with no eyebrows. Uh, and just white hair that sticks up. And it was like three sessions in. I'm like, dude, you've got no eyebrows. And he just starts laughing. He's like, it took you three sessions to realize. I was like, yeah, man, I can tell your face is all fucked up and all weird. If you can pull up a picture of Kevin Downing, it would be great. The dude's got no eyebrows. And uh, anyway, a great human being. But I told Kevin, I was like, look, man, I come from Armenia. My mom and dad are a bit, you know, they, they risked their lives and brought us here. But every time I share this, like, ambition that I have, this drive that I have about putting on a massive live event and giving away a Land Rover, I'm going to fill up 1500 seats for three days. You know, they're like, how are you going to do this? What if it doesn't work out? What if it costs you too much money? What if you lose all this money? And I go, Kevin, I get so pissed off. Like I want them to root for me. And he goes, have you ever thought about editing the relationship? And mm. so editing a relationship with people who you can't eliminate. So the option is to either eliminate, because we talked about curating your circle of influence, right? Mm -hmm. I said, I'm gonna keep people, like ruthlessly manage the people in my circle of influence. If they're high frequency, I want you in it. If you're low frequency, I need you out. Well, and you said, well, what about if they're family and you're kind of stuck there for a period of time? Then you do what Kevin taught, which is you edit that relationship. You spend the least amount of time in that household. Mm -hmm. So you stay busy with sports, with things, with the library, with the coffee shop, with personal training. You don't share your dreams with people who don't understand your dreams because it's too small 
they, their brains are too small to process your big dreams and they're just gonna shit on it. Not because they wanna shit on it, but they're transferring their feelings of fear and doubt and uncertainty. You know, and you're like, no, 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 my mentor said I could do it. You're like, fuck your mentor. They're just taking money from you and you know, right. pipe dreams, right? You're like, no, my personal trainer says I could actually become Mr. Olympia. No, no, you can't go be a doctor instead. And, and so really the answer is like you have to edit the relationship until you've come to a place that you can leave that household. And when you do see your parents or whoever the negative people are, understand that I'm, I can only talk about the things that we have in common. So when I started to see my mom and dad, I didn't talk to them about my big dreams and ambitions anymore. I would, my dad loves tomatoes and beans and he grows cucumbers in the backyard, like he's got a green thumb. So I'm like, hey dad, how are the tomatoes going? How are the bean plants? How are the cucumbers? Right. And he'd take me out and he showed me with pride and he's so excited. And then he asked me, how's business? And the old me used to go, it's great, let me tell you what I'm doing. The new me is, oh, business is good. Show me more tomatoes because I'm gonna edit this relationship that's right. so that his low frequency doesn't fuck me up. That's right. And that's what we have to do. Yeah, and, and a, it's an art form because sometimes it ends There's up, Kevin, yeah. And you can see that's him in the most, that top one is his most recent. No eyebrows whatsoever. And he actually funny. combed his hair in that picture. Let's cl click on that, make that bigger. Oh, there you go, yep. Yeah. What's, what, what's the deal with his eyebrows? I don't know, man. I don't know if it's some <laughs> kind of weird disease or what, but yeah, I love the man of pieces. He that, saved my life. That's awesome. Yeah. And you still go see him? Uh, these days I probably see him like two or three times a year. Okay. I've referred over 200 people to him, men from the project. Yep. Because I only talk about my therapist and when I drop his name, people in men in California, because therapists can only work with the people in their state. Uh -huh. And so he'll always text me like, hey, got another referral from your podcast, got another referral from the project. Uh, and then when I'm in a tight and I'm in a jam or something, and I'm mentally a little fucked up. Hey, Kevin, you got a minute to get on the phone and he always makes time for me. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, just to finish on that thought process, it, it's really difficult to edit relationships because you always... When you go into a, let's call it a, a boxing ring, you want to box. Yeah. So when you instantaneously start to talk to someone in the family, whether it's a brother, it could be a brother, sister, mom, or dad, and you just want to go to that, what ends up happening is it's really hard to create discipline to try to try to veer off that road because you just... It's like emotional vomit. Right, right. And you just want to go there because you just want to be like, dude, let me just go ahead and just release, yeah. get into a screaming match. And then and then at that point, someone hangs up on each other or and then and then you don't talk for weeks right. and, you know, or longer. And what I think you have to do is create discipline to do what you just said, right? And I had a conversation with a friend of mine just the other day about this where you have to as you put it, edit the relationship and say, look, I'm just calling to see how you're doing. Let me just see what's going on. Something that is so low level yeah. and not go into any of those places, right? You know how they say, don't talk about religion or politics, right? right? Don't go into those places with those types of people Bingo. where they want to, to drag you down because you can't not get shit all over you if you wrestle with a pig, right? right? And that's where, when those people have that emotional vomit the, all over them, you, it, you can't joust with those people because if you do, you're just going to get covered in it. So what you got to do is do what you said. And that's something where if you're strong enough, it's actually mastery, bro. Yeah, it cool. really is because you can turn around and do it. And and I'll be honest with you. I, I do that from time to time with my athletes where I know when they have the anxiety and they get all of that and they start to kind of, you know, get real edgy and they just, they want to argue and fight and all of this other stuff. And I just be like, hey, by the way, what, what kind of music are you doing for your posing routine? Right, <laughs> and they're just right. like, wait a minute, I'm mad because they have to do an extra 30 minutes of cardio. And I thought that I don't need to do yeah. any more cardio and what's going on. And it's just yeah. like, you know, something, or hey man, what are you, you going to do this? And, you know, talk about something completely different because you have to try to get them to divert. Yeah, that's a great pattern interrupt. Right. You know, interrupt. We, we, we can literally interrupt someone's pattern of self-destruction or circling the drain by doing exactly that. And that's what a, by the way, the difference between a trainer trainer and a coach, I think maybe Todd Durkins said this. So I got to give credit to good old Todd Durkins. You know, a trainer, he says, knows where the muscle originates and inserts. He says a coach is someone who'll sit there and cry with you at the running blocks or in your case under a squat rack, you know, right. like, 
fuck, man, that sucks that this happened. Or, you know, at backstage, right? A good coach, like, knows what they're feeling. And, and, and that's, that's what you do, man, um, where you're able to do a pattern interrupt so that they're not circling the drain. They're depleted. Their show's coming up. They're freaking out. 30 minutes more of cardio. That's all they're stressing over. And you know as a coach how to change that pattern and get them in a different vibrational frequency. And that's a huge difference between trainers and coaches. Yeah, and a lot of people don't understand that because they just they just continue to feel like it's about counting reps and doing those. And if you really want to be a really good coach, what you have to do is you have to know what can motivate somebody and be able to create that trigger. Why are they there? What can you do to be able to get them to feel good about themselves? Some people, you need to kind of give them a little more pat on the back and you got to give them a little bit of that because they're always down on themselves and you need to help prop them up. And I'm not saying like you have to sit there and blow sunshine up their ass, but you just got to give them a little bit of that when they do do those extra couple of reps, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. You got to do, you got to give that. Then there's others who it's never good enough. And if you ask Phil Heath, he'll tell you like it was never good enough for me and him. But I know that that was something that that was our dynamic, right? right? But I can't use that same dynamic in other athletes, even though the other ones are Mr. Olympias too that I've worked with, right? And I'm sitting here scratching my head going, okay, what is the trigger point? Because some people don't use that same fuel. So you have to turn around and say, okay, am I using diesel or am I using, you know, rocket fuel? Because everybody burns differently. And so with that being said, I think that, you know, programs like yourself, putting those things together. And um, is there anything else you want to share with the audience? Because this is just, uh, and guys, let me know this. Don't forget 80 some odd percent of you guys who are listening to my podcast, especially on YouTube, do not subscribe. You guys are not scared, but you come back over and over again. So don't forget to press the subscribe button because it's important because then when I do do these podcasts or you see my training videos, then you're going to be notified. But I want to be able to also, you guys are going to see uh, Bedros's links on the uh, underneath the the videos, so that way you'll be able to connect with him, go on his IG, and go to you know be able to see what he's doing on the daily because you are posting literally once or twice a day, brother. Yeah, I mean yeah. you are a machine. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like I've, I've in life, my earlier part of life, I've acquired such mass amounts of karmic debt that I made the commitment to. I like that. What'd you call that? Karmic debt. Karmic debt. Yeah, yeah. I was a bit of a shit bag in my in my late teens. So you're saying from days. all the good, you're, you're you're basically getting karma back, good karma back yeah. from all the things. Yeah. So I, now what I'm doing is I'm depositing in the Goodwill bank account. Nice. You know, um, and I feel like one of the ways I do that is by giving so I push the free line. The things that I used to charge for, I yeah. give away for free. Yeah. And so then I then people are like, well, what can I buy from you? Well, if you've got 100 grand, you can buy a year of coaching for me, business coaching. Right. And guys, that, that's no joke. It's 100 grand yeah. for business coaching. If he takes you, it's not a matter of like, it's not, it's a full application process. We didn't get too deep into this, but just to touch on this, Bedros coaches coaches. And when it comes to that, you got to understand $100,000, but he'll turn around and put his time into somebody that he feels has the potential. And so that's what he tends to do because of the, his passion for this. Right. And so to me, it's like, I'll push the free line and I'll give this stuff that other, other people will charge for. I'll give it away for free. But then my franchise is $55,000 to buy in and then uh, 6% royalties. Uh, my coaching program, the domination year is a hundred grand with, like you said, an application process. Uh, the project now is $18,000. And so people go, well, you know, what if I can't afford those high-end stuff? I'm like, that's why I'm putting out two episodes a week on YouTube, mm-hmm. uh, one episode a week on Spotify, iTunes, and then several times a day on Instagram and social media that you can literally benefit from for free. But because it's free, I think people go, oh, well, this probably isn't as valuable. Well, it actually is. It's advice that I also give to my coaching clients. Now, it may be more specific to them, and I draw it out, and I make the introductions and right. connections they need to people, et cetera, and 100 grand gets you a lot of access, right? Um, but... You know, I think people take for granted, like you and I grew up at a time where we didn't have social media. Like, again, another question you asked, well, what if someone doesn't have a dad figure in their life? Right. You do now because you go to Instagram, you can go, I want Tim Grover to be a dad figure for me. I want Bedros to be a dad figure for me. I want Hani to be my fitness dad figure. Mm -hmm. Like you could literally curate awesome dad figures. 
we didn't grow up in that time. We, I looked at Flex Magazine and Muscle and Fitness Magazine, and, and I was like, okay, well, gee, you know, Dorian Yates and Flex Wheeler, wow, you know, I, I hope I could one day build a physique like that. But I didn't have access to them to talk to them. You probably did. I didn't. No, I didn't either. Yeah. Not at that time. Yeah, but you get what I'm saying, right? Now, today yeah. on social media, like, they're listening to this. They're listening to two people who have their own zone of geniuses for free. Right. Uh, but they're like, oh, it's good entertainment. No, motherfucker, it's also good actionable content. And so if there was one thing that I want to... You said, what more should we share? It's like, take action on this free stuff because it's just as valuable as the paid stuff if you value it, you know? That's strong. Yeah. Super strong. Yeah. Oh, brother. Thank you so much for stopping by. I know you're super, super busy. And um, just when you texted me and said, man, I'm in Dallas, I was like, I'm so glad I'm here right now because I'm getting ready to leave for the Arnold tomorrow. And I was like, you got to come by, get a workout in, let's do a podcast. So let's go do this workout. And um, that way I can show you some cool machines. Yes, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. No, thank you for coming again, guys. So you'll get all the information on Bedros down in uh, the uh, summary below. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share. And let me know what you thought of this podcast because I am definitely going to be in the comments. And I appreciate you all. Hani Rambod, Bedros, and that's the truth.